from the Spec Network, this is Fragmented, an Android developer podcast where we talk about building good software and becoming better Android developers. I'm Don Felker. Welcome to the show. This episode of Fragmented is brought to you by BuddyBuild. BuddyBuild is a mobile-optimized continuous integration and delivery platform that takes just a couple of minutes to set up. Thousands of mobile development teams love BuddyBuild because it's one of the fastest ways to build, test, distribute, and gather feedback on their applications. With every Git push, BuddyBuild kicks off a new build, runs the UI tests in parallel on real devices, and then automatically deploys the build to users via Slack or email. And then with a simple screenshot, testers can send their feedback directly to you along with important diagnostic details. Furthermore, If your app ever crashes, BuddyBuild will record the frequency, affected users, and traces back to the exact lines of source code that caused the crash in the first place. Join thousands of developers who've already added BuddyBuild to their development process. Try it for free today at fragmentedpodcast.com slash BuddyBuild. Thanks, BuddyBuild. Today, we're going to talk about item number 12 in the Effective Java for Android developer series here on the Fragmented Podcast. Now, if you're just joining us, you're probably wondering what this is. We are doing actually a series, kind of we drop in every once in a while a little fragment episode that's anywhere from 7 to 20 minutes long, and we talk about an item from the book called Effective Java, written by the amazing Joshua Block. And there's a bunch of items in here that talk about various different components of the Java language. Uh, how the internals work, some of the weird nuances, things you need to be careful of, how you should implement them. It's just chock full of amazing knowledge that we just want to share here on the podcast. And Kaushik and I are just basically going through each one individually and publishing them out as little mini fragments. So with that said, today we're going to be hopping right into item number 12, and that's consider implementing comparable. Now, what exactly is comparable? That's a phenomenal question. Comparable is actually just an interface with a single method on it. And that method is compare to. Now, by implementing comparable, it basically states that class has a natural ordering built into it. So you can go ahead and sort an array of those objects that you create with that class that implement comparable by simply using the arrays.sort method. You can pass in that array and it will sort them based upon the logic that you have specified inside of the compare to method. Now, when would you want to implement comparable? Well, that's kind of a simple one to answer. Anytime you want to be able to sort something and provide some type of natural interface around it. So let's say that you had a, maybe a customer object and you decided that you wanted to, all when you sort them, you always wanted to sort them by last name, comma, first name in alphabetical order. So if you have two different folks with last name is Smith, Uh, they're going to be almost at the same location. So we need to look at the first name, Jane and John, if those were the two records, Jane Smith and John Smith. We need to take a look at both of those to determine which one is first. Now, again, they both start with the letter J for the first name. And so we have to hop into the second letter. And then at that point, we'd see that Jane would actually naturally come first in the alphabet, and then John would come. So if we wrote our comparable method and implemented it correctly, the sort that would then return would have an array that had Jane Smith first, and then it would have John Smith afterwards. Now, most of the actual value classes in the Java platform libraries implement comparable for you. So if you're going to go ahead and have an array of strings and you want to sort them, this is already built in for you. Now, when we're working with the comparable interface, what you need to do is actually implement comparable and it's going to take a type parameter. So it's using generics and you're going to pass your type in there. So if you're using a customer object, it would say comparable of type customer. So how does the compare to method actually work? Now, when you implement the comparable of type customer or whatever you're working with, you're going to notice that you have to implement a compare to method. That method is going to return an integer value and it's going to provide you with a parameter of type T. So if you're implementing the interface of comparable of type customer, you're going to have to implement a method that returns of type integer and the compare to method will have a parameter of type customer inside of it that you need to work with. Now, what this does is this method allows you to perform some logic, and it's going to allow you to compare the object that you're given with the specified object to determine its order. Now, what you're going to, re- again, we're returning an integer here. So what do these integers mean? Uh, and what, what integer values should we return? Now, you're going to return an, an, either a negative integer, a zero, or a positive integer as 
the object is either less than, equal to, or greater than the specified object. You can also throw a class cast exception if the specifies object type prevents it from being compared to this object. So maybe you've implemented comparable, but instead of a customer, you have a platinum customer. And for some reason, you don't want to be able to compare those types of customers. You could then perform an, an instance of check to see if this customer is of the correct type and throw a class cast exception or so forth of that nature. Now, you also must make sure that if a particular X value compares to a Y value equals a Y value compared to the X value, then you must make sure that those match. And this also ensures that if you are trying to compare X to Y and it throws an exception, then Y compared to X should also throw an exception as well. Uh, you know, which kind of speaks to the, the underlying truth of what we're trying to get at here is that the implementer must ensure that the relation is transitive. So if X is compared to Y is, you know, greater than zero here. So meaning that the positive value is then returned means that it's greater. And then if Y compared to Z is also positive, meaning that it's greater then X compared to Z may also be true as well. And so that's the, the transitive property here that you must follow. Now, it's really hard to explain this when we're talking here on the podcast. So this is just, again, a high level. So if we're returning a negative integer, that means that the object is less than. If you return a zero, it remains, it means that the objects are equal based upon the logic that you implement inside of the compare to method. And if the value that you return is positive, it means that the object is greater than the specified other specified object. So if you're working with our previous example of a customer, you want to order them based upon their names, you're then going to go ahead and maybe you have their first or last name from the customer objects. You may check if we have Jane Smith and John Smith, and you'll notice that Jane starts with J-A and John starts with J-O. Well, we already know that the last names are equal. So this logic that we're, we're checking the names is going to be in the compare to method. We're going to check that last name. Does the last name, is it greater than? So if we're, we're working with a Jane Smith and a, and a Jenny Jones, well, now we realize that Jones is now specified before Smith because of our alphabetized ordering that we're looking to implement. At that point, we would return the value that you know basically said, hey, this Jenny value that was passed to us is actually less than this current object, which is the Smith object itself. Now, if we're comparing the last names and they're the same, like the two Smiths example that we had a second ago, you then would have to move into some more logic to check the first names to see which ones are then, you know, greater than, equal to, or less than, so you can implement the proper logic and then return either the same or less than and so forth. And that's when you're just going to return those values. And normally you're going to return either like a negative one, a zero, or a one. Now there are different instances of, of different classes inside of the Java libraries that depend on comparisons. And these include like sorted collections such as tree set, tree map, and there's also the utility classes that we've always kind of been familiar with, which are the collection classes and array class arrays class, which contains searching and sorting algorithms for use. Now, there are a couple of provisions that we want to make sure that we follow here. And Joshua is very good about really breaking this down. So it's really understandable. And I'm just going to kind of touch on these briefly here. Um, and, and the first provision says that basically, if we reverse the comparison between two object references, the expected thing should happen. And that should be is if the first object is less than the second, well, then the second object is greater than the first. Another one is if the first object is equal to the second, then the second must also be equal to the first. And if the first object is greater than the second, then the second must be less than the first. Now these all kind of make sense if you just kind of write it down in the truth table. Is this value, you know, is one greater than two? Yes, okay, is two, is one less than two, excuse me, is yes, is two greater than one? Yes, uh, you know, and then so forth. So there's these different properties you wanna make sure of. Now the second provision says that if one object is greater than a second and the second is greater than a third, then the first must be greater than the third as well. So remember, so we're saying the first object is greater than the second object. And we're saying that the second object is greater than the third object. So let's put some, you know, let's put some concrete example to that. So let's say we have the first object is, we'll just use integers here as a value. The first object is 10. So we'll call that number one or let's use letters, it's a little bit easier, that's A. So A is 10. And then we have B, which is seven. 
So A is greater than B, right? It's because 10 is greater than seven. And then we have C and that value is four. Well, B is greater than C and since A is greater than B because 10 is greater than seven, well, and because of that, pro that property that says that, hey, because B is greater than C, that means A must be greater than C. And so you have to make sure that provision is true. Now, the final provision says that all the objects that compare is equal must always be equal when compared to those same other objects. Now, when we are writing the compare to method, there's a couple of things you should be aware of here. The parameter is statically typed. Remember using generics here. So we don't have to perform any type checking or casting at that point in time. You know, if the, if the arguments are the wrong type, it won't even compile because the compiler is not going to allow it. Now, if the argument is actually null, your invocation, and this is recommended, is to throw a null pointer exception, which is I know everybody's favorite exception. And because it will as soon as the other methods uh, attempt to access any of its other members itself. So it should be throwing a null pointer exception if that argument is null. Now, when you're also comparing different primitive fields, you're going to want to use the relationship operators, the relational operators, which are the greater than or less than sign. But for floating point fields such as doubles or floats, you're going to want to use the double dot compare or the float dot compare in place of those relationship, uh, these relational operators, because they don't really abide by the general contract for compare to when applied to floating point values. Now, there's some other details here, then if you really want, would like to dive into it, uh, definitely check out the effective Java book here and take a look at this item if you really want some more details, but that's kind of the high level here. Now, this other last thing that I'm going to mention here is that if a class has multiple significant fields, this goes back to the customer situation that I uh, explained a, a few moments ago. We want to compare the customer's last name and their first name. And we're going to then, depending upon the different fields, things are going to happen differently. Now, the order in which you compare them is critical. So you must start with the most significant field and work your way down. Let's relate this back to the customer object. If I'm going to be ordering based upon last name comma first, Jones is going to come before Smith. So that's obvious. So we need to compare the last name first. I would not compare the first name. That's that's not the most significant field. The most significant field at the initial implementation is to check the last name. Now, if the last names are the same, I need to go to the most the next most significant field. And at that point, it's going to be the first name. And so if you have many different significant fields that you need to compare, which can happen with some complex objects, then you will need to make sure that you're always checking the most next significant field on the way down as you're determining the proper order. So let's go ahead and, and take a quick recap here. Item number 12 is consider implementing the comparable interface. The comparable interface has a single method called compare to. This is a statically typed interface, meaning that we need to provide the type so we can implement the proper method. So if we have a customer class, I'm going to implement the comparable interface of type customer. That's going to require me to implement a method, which is going to return an integer with the name of compare to as the method name, and it's gonna have one argument, which is going to be a customer. At that point, I can then compare that object that's given to me with the current object, and then I can return three different values. I can return a negative integer, which determines that the item is less than. I can return a zero, which means that the objects are then equal, or I can return a positive value, which indicates that the items are greater than. Now we don't really have any particular reasons why this is important in, jo in Java versus Android because Android is Java underneath the hood. So this is kind of one of those core Java principles that you need to understand because you're gonna use things like array.sort or, or the collections utilities or maybe the tree set or anything like that and sorted collections. So it's one of those things that you're eventually gonna have to implement. And also the great thing about it is, is this just pure Java? So you can implement the comparable interface. And because I know all of you are writing great tests for all of your applications, you can simply write a JUnit test to verify that your behavior is as you expected. Pass in one object, compare it to the other one. Is it less than, equal to, or greater than? Do the same thing for each one of your instances, and then write a final test that passes in maybe an array of just random items that you, well, not random, it's a, in a hermetic state, but you've actually created an unsorted list, and then you pass it, maybe the arrays.sort method, pass in your array, and then you check to verify that the values came out correctly on the other side. Again, because this is an, a JUnit test, it's going to be super fast, and it's going to be very useful to ensure that you either did or didn't implement the interface correctly, and as usual, 
also provides that nice test coverage future for later developers if they decide to change something and the test then catches it because of an unknown issue. So I hope that helps. Again, this is gonna be item number 12, consider implementing comparable in the effective Java book by Joshua Block. Once again, we'd like to thank our sponsor for this episode, BuddyBuild. Again, BuddyBuild is a mobile optimized continuous integration and delivery platform that takes just a few minutes to set up. It'll kick off new builds, helps with crash reporting, user and tester feedback, and all kinds of good stuff. Join thousands of other developers today who've already added BuddyBuild to their development process. Try it for free at fragmentedpodcast.com slash BuddyBuild. Thanks, BuddyBuild. That's it for the show, folks. If you'd like to contact us, the best way to get a hold of us is going to be through Twitter. And our Twitter handle is at FragmentedCast. If you'd like to reach me, you can reach me at Don Felker on Twitter. And if you'd like to reach the illustrious Kaushik Gopal, his Twitter handle is at Kaushik Gopal. Or you can also contact us both on our website at FragmentedPodcast.com. Fragment is hosted by Don Felker and, well, Kaushik Gopal. Unfortunately, Kaushik's not here today. We edit all of the Fragmented episodes ourselves, and the amazing Sarah from the Spec Network helps us with production assistance and wraps our final mix. Our theme music and ad music is produced by Alan Taylor. You can find more episodes of the show on Pocket Cast, Google Play Music, or any of your favorite Pocket theaters around. Though we do love Pocket Cast. Our website is Fragmented Podcast, and you can find the links to all of the stuff we say on our show on the site. Thank you for listening. We'll catch you next time.